Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Darian Jones. I'm the Caregiver Education and Digital Specialist at Care Partners. We're a nonprofit organization who's dedicated to providing support, education, and resources to family caregivers and quality care to their loved ones with uh, challenges of aging and memory issues. Um, during this time of social distancing and quarantine, we are going to be doing hot topic live segments on our social media pages, on our Facebook and our YouTube channel. So every day we're reading, we're going to be doing some sort of segment. So be sure to join us. Uh, this afternoon, we're going to be welcoming back Martha Woofter. She is a certified care manager, um, among a bunch of other things. But today she's going to be talking to us about uh, Shakespeare Healing Gardens. Hi, Martha. Hello, Darian. Thank you. Hello, as Darian said, I'm going to be talking about Shakespeare Healing Gardens. Now, I'm, I'm writing a book called Shakespeare's Oasis, um, teaching, proposing different themes for all of his, his plays. Today, we're going to talk about All's Well That Ends Well, and I'll do a little background on why plants for Shakespeare and uh, why healing gardens for All's Well That Ends Well. Shakespeare grew up surrounded by nature. Um, Stratford, Stratford upon Avon sat on the edge of Arden Forest, land since cleared for agriculture. Arden Forest and the surrounding land was owned by Shakespeare's mother and his family. Um, her name was Mary Arden. More than any other writer, he understood the subtleties and the very essence of plants. The mythologies of his day and the daily purpose of the plants were woven into the fabric of his scripts, recited by actors with the same knowledge and beliefs. As most writers fall in and out of popularity, William Shakespeare's understanding of universal human characteristics has catapulted him further into the limelight with each century. Traits prevalent 400 years ago are still with us today. We are still motivated by the desire to help and love others, as well as jealousy, envy, and greed. The playwright, poet, and accomplished gardener expressed joy and angst by painting pictures. His brush was poetry, drawn from his keen observations of human nature, changes in seasons, and plants. He saw with the, an artist's eye the nuances of color, which he incorporated into his poetry. A gardener and astute observer of human qualities and motivations utilized the plants of his day to comment on human frailties or build a scene based on everyday life of 16th century. A famous line from Midsummer Night's Dream reflects Shakespeare's ability to use plants to make a point. I know a bank where the wild thyme blows, where ox lips and the nodding violet grows. Wild thyme, violets, and ox lips which is a, a hybrid between cowslips and primroses, are carefully chosen elements of Titania's bed. Now, this is discussing um, Titania, the queen of the fairies, and the line is recited by Oberon, who was the king of the fairies. So he's talking about her bed. And time... Um, I'm sorry, um, primroses were thought to open the door to fairyland. Drinking a brew of wild thyme was believed to allow one to see the fairies. Cowslips were considered cherished and protected by fairies. Now, violets were an aesthetic addition to her bedchamber because they were considered to be the sweetest fragrance of all flowers. Much of the significance given plants during the Elizabethan era holds true today. We discuss offering an olive branch in Peace Talks. 
Although culinary tastes have changed, some of the recipes remain. Marzipan, which is an almond paste called March Pain in Shakespeare's tragic play Romeo and Juliet, is still a common dessert item. Chamomile tea is drunk for relaxation. Next slide. In addition to, now my, my master's and um, my education and my background are in theater. So it, with a focus on Shakespeare, that's Shakespeare. In addition to the acting, I was also a master gardener and a landscape designer. So um, first I'll just discuss briefly the six steps to basic garden design which is utilized in Shakespeare gardens. The first point is style. There are two styles, informal and formal. Now, formal gardens are preferred by only 5% of the population. Think hedges. They, the formal gardens um, are the same all year. They don't change through the seasons. They have straight lines. Informal gardens, preferred by 95% of the population, changes from season to season. So it's blooming plants. So it's annuals and perennials and blooming shrubs and trees. And um, it's not usually symmetrical. It's not straight lines. It um, usually has a lot of curves. Point of view. Point of view can be um, from the street. So if you have a front yard that you don't use, you just go out the front door and go to your car and leave. It's only seen from the street. That is a particular point of view. You can have a kitchen garden, um, which is um, a planter outside your kitchen window. That's another point of view. Another point of view could be a night garden in an area where you only go to sit during the cool of the night. And finally, you can have a a play area in the back yard, or you can have walking paths or a pergola where you're seeing the, the plants up close and personal. So you have to decide before designing your garden what the use is and where it's going to be seen from. Next, we, we talk about theme. Now theme can be simply color. You can go with hot colors, the yellows and the reds, you can go with cool colors, which are the blues and the lavenders and the purples. You can um, be more specific, such as a kitchen garden, you, which might have herbs. It might you might even have a vegetable garden. So, but it's used for a specific person or a pollinator garden, um, designed to attract butterflies and hummingbirds. A night garden, as I said before. Um, could be a theme or a Shakespeare garden. So it can be as specific or as general as you want. Now the environment that you put, where you put the plant is important for keeping the plants alive. The environment is the amount of sun. Full sun is considered six to eight hours of sun a day. The morning sun is, um, milder than the afternoon sun. The afternoon sun is hotter. And in, in the Houston area in particular, we have to be very aware that our summers are hot. Now where I came from in Minnesota, the winters are cold. So typically we don't have winter gardens up there. You can here. Um, they would be um, the spring plants in Minnesota, such as the pansies, would be in a winter garden. But um, so the environment, the soil is also a factor of the environment, a big factor. We have a lot of clay down here. So we have to supplement the soil. We also have to elevate the gardens because we have so much rainfall. Another factor. Now in Britain, where Shakespeare was, the um, weather is more temperate. It's, it's milder than it is in Houston. So often, if we're going to use plants mentioned by Shakespeare, we'll have to use a plant with similar characteristics in the same family. The um, colors are the next thing to consider. 
Now, I was talking about hot colors, the yellows and the reds. Yellows and reds can be seen from a distance. The hot colors, the apricots, can be seen from a distance. So if you have a point of view that is seen only from the street, you would want hot colors because people can actually see the garden. If you have a garden where um, you go out to the pergola and drink your tea and you relax, so you have a walking path, you can use cool colors. They're more calming. The hot colors are very stimulating. Of course, um, you can add contrasts. I, I usually add contrasts in the picture that you're seeing is blues and apricots. Now, actually, in that garden, there were just as many blues as there were apricots. But um, they, I, I had the two colors for the contrast. Um, if you were going to have a night garden, you would use whites. There are plants that only open at night or, or are only fragrant at night. Moonflower um, opens at night only. Um, musk roses are most fragrant at night. So if you have an area where you go to sit, you have a bench and you're using it at night, you would use white flowers, not only so that the pollinators, the nighttime pollinators can see the plants, but so that you can see the plants as well. The, the final step for basic garden design is variation. And that can be anything from height to foliage to blossom color, foliage color, it can be large and small blossoms, large and small foliage. You can have feathery foliage along with some very large leaves. Next slide. Shakespeare garden design. Okay, now you follow the, uh, the basic garden design, but what makes a Shakespeare garden specifically a Shakespeare garden is that you're using plants referenced by William Shakespeare in his plays, sonnets, and poems. Now, as I said, if the particular plant that he mentions does not grow in Houston, use something similar. For instance, um, Austin is a big area for lavender. There are lavenders that can grow in the Houston area, probably not the specific lavender that Shakespeare saw, but it's similar enough. All lavenders are similar enough. They have a similar fragrance. They have a similar colored flower. So the lavenders are similar enough that you can definitely substitute. Now, I am writing a book called um, Shakespeare's Oasis. The meat of the book is finished, but I am now proposing a theme for each play. And, um, I am actually in the process of designing gardens to go with those themes. So the next slide indicates, um, talks about all's well that ends well. I've chosen the healing garden for all's well that ends well. Helena is the, the primary character in all's well that ends well. Now, just a side note, all's well that ends well is considered a comedy. The definition of a comedy, particularly in the 16th century, was that the ending was something that they considered to be a happy ending, a Disney ending. So this, although this play is, is fairly dark all throughout, the final scene has couplings and what, what Elizabethans would consider a happy ending. Helena's deceased father, was a renowned and talented physician. Now, women were not allowed medical training during that time, but on because he knew that he would not live forever and he had discovered cures for ailments that no one else had discovered, he didn't want his knowledge to die with him. So he trained Helena in the medical arts. And um, when the king um, became ill with a uh, mysterious illness and none of his physicians could cure him, his physicians all told him he was going to die. 
that that was it. He had they could not do anything for him. She not only diagnosed the ailment, but she cured it. So the king rewarded her, and thus we have the happy ending. In the next slide, we talk about um, healing, healing plants. Now, for thousands of years, wise women were the primary healers for everyone. As Europe grew and women were barred from medical institutions, um, the wise women who Shakespeare does mention in his plays, and actually the idea of Helena curing the king is quite an advanced notion for the 16th century. So the, the women who had been healers out in the woods, testing the herbs and the plants, discovering what they did um, were, were barred from the medical institutions and actually they were labeled as witches to keep them from doing what they did. Now people in rural areas or who had no money had no other options, but um, for po political reasons, um, the, they were supposed to go to um, the, the monasteries or to the apothecaries, et cetera, who were all men, and to the, the, the doctors. Um, so the women were labeled as witches, and there are scant records, but it is estimated that between 200,000 and 9 million were killed. Not all of them women, but the vast majority were women over the age of 40 because since this was a lifetime profession, the older women were the women with more knowledge. Homeopathic remedies at that point fell into disfavor. Now this, um, the witch hunts, um, were, went well in, into the 17th century, so beyond Shakespeare's death. He died in 1616, but the, um, the women were being burned as witches long after he died. In the 20th century, the natural healing was rediscovered. And we'll talk about that in the next slide. Because um, I wanted to use, utilize more plants, I have designed a healing garden for sun and a separate one for shade. Now the amaranth and the fennel, which are on this slide, are both considered annuals, although my fennel has come back a uh, second year. It survived the winter. My amaranth was blown over in heavy winds because it gets very tall and, and leggy. Um, all, since those are tall and since the rosemary gets very large down here, um, those would be at the back of the garden because um, you don't want to hide the other ones. Now the daisy and the hyssop are um, full sun to partial sun. Now I have found some full sun to partial sun plants do burn in the summer here in Houston. So you may want to shelter the daisy and the hyssop a bit. Right now my daisy and my hyssop are doing very well in my full sun garden. But um, I don't know whether they will survive the winter. I know my chamomile, which is also considered full sun to partial sun, did burn in the summer last year. So as I already mentioned, the lavender, um, you have to find one specific to the Houston area. The sweet lavender is actually considered the, the lavender that grows best in the Houston area. Um, in Austin, it's much drier. They don't have the humidity. So lavender is perfect for the hill country. Um, here, we have to find lavender that can survive the humidity and more than the heat. Now the marjoram and the mint are very spreading and they spread underground, just slightly underground. It's not actually difficult to keep contained, but I recommend, because they grow quite quickly and it can become invasive, burying them in 
um, pots. So bury, put them in a pot, large pot, and bury the pot. The um, shed garden, which is the next slide, has the balm, um, the chamomile, the columbine, cowslips, and violets. So now my shade garden is cooler colors. The sun garden um, has some cooler, cooler colors with the lavender and the hyssop, but it also has the, the daisy, which is the white and the yellows. So I, this, the balm is also called lemon balm. And it um, actually, chamomile and lemon balm are both used for um, calming effect. They can bo both be excellent teas. The cowslip, I'm still waiting on the seeds for the cowslip. It's a little more difficult to find here. Um, there will be a um, attached to the, the um, on the blog, there is a description of the growing specs and of all of these plants that I've mentioned today, along with uses. So you can see, um, what the plants are used for. There is also, um, I have also included a resource list for activities that you can do in isolation because I know we're all going a little, um, a little bonkers. So, um, Darian, thank you very much. That was really interesting, Martha. Thank you so much. Um, so they're called healing gardens. That's based just on the different types of plants have healing they're properties or? Because all of these plants are used homeopathically for healing in one way or another. Now on the, um, on the, the document, the reason I'm attaching the document or having you attach the document that describes them is because they can look at that and see what healing purpose all of these different plants have how you can oh, yeah very interesting we're gonna have that up on uh, the care partners blog later this afternoon um we also have martha's video from last week where she showed us how to freeze and dry herbs to make gift jars that was a really fun one too um so can you tell us a little bit about why um gardening in and of itself can be healing Oh, yes. Thank you for asking that. Recent studies have indicated that soil has antidepressant microbes. So I always thought gardening was my therapy. And I found out I was not wrong. It's um, the, the vitamin D from the sun is very healing, but also the soil itself. So I prefer to garden barefooted and barehanded. Mm -hmm. And if people want to do this project at home, where would you suggest is the best place to pick up these plants? They can have the um, plants delivered. I purchased a lot of these plants from Arbor Gate, which is a nursery in Tomball. But most of these plants are common enough that they would also be at Home Depot um, or Lowe's. Great. Well, thank you so much. This was a really fun activity that anyone can do at home. Um, we are going to be doing more segments like this. So we're going to say goodbye to Martha for now. Thanks again for coming again for joining us, Martha. Thank you very much, Darian. And thank you guys so much for joining us as well. Care Partners is um, also offering tele. Uh, teleconference phone calls for Common Ground twice a week. So Tuesday mornings and Thursday afternoons, you can find more information about how to call in on our website. Um, and again, be sure to follow all of our social media pages, our Facebook and our YouTube. We also have Instagram and Twitter where you can get updates, pictures, and more helpful information. Um, if there's any topics or segments that you'd like us to do or cover, please comment below and let us know. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, and we will see you again tomorrow with some more Hot Topic Live segments. Have a great afternoon.